Well, now I'm really going to give you a college course today. Whoever finds this one day will be very grateful for all the work that's down there. <laughs> today I'm going to be quoting from at least 40 respected theologians and Christian authors of the last, of this century and the last, on the subject of the birthday of the new humanity. I say that, I like to spend lots of time on these things and give you a little, because I always say, though not everyone you know understands these things, as their cauldron would say, plenty do. Plenty do. And I want us today to pour concrete on top of concrete to settle how big a thing has happened since Christ rose from the dead. The bodily resurrection of Christ from the dead on that first Easter Sunday was about more than his triumph over Satan and sin on humanity's behalf. Now that's big, and that is important, but if you flatten Christianity out to mean just that, as big and important as that is, you miss it. For years before God showed me these things, so, so much of it had no purpose. Oh, I don't mean I didn't know the Bible. I always knew the Bible. But I didn't see purpose in it until the second sentence here. Not only was it the, his triumph over Satan and sin on our behalf, but it was also the commencement of something new. Uh, something new that had been in the heart of God from the beginning, and that was birthing a second or ultimate human race through his son to replace the first on a new earth and new heavens. And God knew to take everything, his son's life. Well, that would never happen. It is interesting, Adam and Eve were not a people of the Spirit. And the miracle of the new creation is that in, an, in a spiritual sense, it's a new gender. I don't mean male-female, although that's brought up too by the Apostle. What I mean is ethnic group. You had Jews, the people of God, his children, busy reading things where all of them realized that or not for the coming Messiah. You had the Gentiles who were called the heathen. Now today, you have a different group. They're called brothers of God, of Christ. That never existed before. Don't you tell me Isaiah said, I'm a brother of Christ. Yeah. He never did. Yeah. It's a different category of people here, boys. There used to be Jews. There used to be Gentiles. And in the physical realm, they may well still be. But as far as this thing Christ achieved on the cross and, and his resurrection on the third day was concerned, a new order was created. Something new happened. And all of a sudden, human beings became brothers of the Son of Almighty God, the second person of the Godhead. And that's very big. And we must understand it and, and embrace it. And you see, until you understand how new you really are and the implications of that newness, it's all guesswork. And you, 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 you can't stand on guesswork when trouble comes, when difficulties arise, when loneliness overwhelms you. When purpose is questioned. There are four scriptures I want us to look at. One we looked at on Wednesday night and I'm going to read it again because it is the, the biggest scripture on the subject of the new humanity. And that's in Ephesians 2. I need you to turn to these. We'll go a little slower today and we'll do a little bit more serious work here. Uh, this is not your standard Easter Sunday service, but you're not a standard Easter Sunday congregation. <laughs> so it's more than likely your fault. Aren't it? <laughs> Ephesians chapter 2. Here, contrasting for the Ephesian church members what they were and are, he says, 
You were two separate people before Christ, Jew and Gentile. Now you're one. That's a new thing. In verse 14 he says, For he himself, Jesus, is our peace, who has made both one. Who's the both? Jews and Gentiles. One. So somehow this thing that Jesus accomplished on the cross and his following resurrection made both one. Now I know we don't look both one. And that's the miracle of this whole thing going on right now, that this is a, a, a move of the Holy Spirit, this new age, this new world, this new creation. And therefore it can't be seen in the natural. But he made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation. They were a separate people, having abolished in Christ's flesh the enmity, the war that existed between them. That is the law of commandments contained in ordinances. Here we go, another pivotal phrase. So as to create in himself, that is Jesus, one new man from two. Did you see that? One new man from the two. One new man from the two. What two? Jew and Gentile. What one new man? New creation. Now the next scripture he'll elaborate on that. But I want you to see it now. You see, you are now reconciled to God, the rest of that verse says through 16, in one body. That is Christ's body. That's not talking about a big universal invisible flub called the body of Christ, which doesn't exist. It's talking about in Christ, buddy. There's nothing invisible about him. And there's nothing invisible about your oneness with him. It's all spiritual. Right. So he says, let's settle this. First of all, there were two ethnic groups. That even as far as access is concerned, wipes out gender difference, male, female. And these two different groups, ethnic groups, and even gender groups, when you break down the ethnic groups themselves, are now one new man. Now that's new creation. Something brand new, never seen before. You've got to understand that and grasp that, sit down and say, glory to God, and kick your shoes off. Yeah. You've got to stop dead in your tracks and say, excuse me, what kind of a thing is this that I have received in Christ? I'm, uh, I'm one. And by the way, that blows out the door. Any such thing as a Messianic Christian, that is an abomination. There's no such animal. Nope. Right. That's just an arrogant human being. Yeah. One new man means you're finished. Amen. Now, second verse. No, let me say this. A new spiritual ethnic group in Christ has been created. A new creation, a new ethnic group. A new spiritual ethnic group. This brought the years of ethnic preference to an end. I can't stand it. I shake when I hear folks talking about Israel as the place of God, the people of God. What am I? A chopped liver? Mm -hmm. I'm the one new man. That's right. You want to come to Mount Zion, go where God dwells, and right now it's right in this living room. Amen. Before you showed up, it was my living room. When you showed up, it was a temple. And that's the end of that. Abraham's sons and daughters of faith are Jew and Gentile, one new man. That's what God promised Abraham. Now let's get to the scripture. Galatians 3, Galatians 3, 26. And here he, he gives us uh, a, a, even a, a deeper explanation, I won't say better, of one new man. Galatians 3, 26. For you are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ, or Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ are put on Christ. And by the way, he doesn't mind saying baptized into Christ because he understands the fact that you understand you were saved by grace through faith that not of yourselves and justified by faith. But when you were baptized, you were baptized into Christ. You're not afraid of the language and I'm not afraid of the language. Some people get very nervous and invent things there. There's neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, there's neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. You are all one. What does he mean? He's not talking about here the, the great big universal one. He's talking about one kind of guy. 
You're all one in Christ. You're all the same thing. Can I put it that way? You're all the same thing in Christ now. There's no difference. Could I explain something here? For, was I, the charismatics have gone crazy on this, and I'm not a charismatic, by the way. I'm, I love them. I believe in them. Wish them for the best, but I'm not one, just in case you want to know. There is a difference between male and female. If you aren't sure, take a shower together. <laughs> That's just starting the problem. <clears throat> but as far as access to God, you're exactly the same. When I first got married, before I got married, uh, 1970, I said to my wife, my darling, you have a relationship with God? I have a relationship with God. Don't look to me for your relationship to God, and I won't look to you for your, for my relationship to God, which you have yours and I have mine. Both of them the same uh, high priest in heaven, but you got yours, I got mine. Now, you want to pursue yours? Fine, I want to pursue mine. You wouldn't want to marry me in the direction I'm planning on going in. She laughed and smiled, and she wanted to. That was 46 and a half years ago. <coughs> the fact of the matter is, access, we're the same. Yeah. Who you are, is, we have plenty to say, but not right now, and it's not even important. What is important is, you are all one in Christ. You are one. Next scripture I want us to see. Acts 26, then we're going to fly. Acts 26, 22, and 23, ladies and gentlemen. Therefore, having obtained help from God, to this day I stand witnessing both to small and great, saying no other things than those which the prophets and Moses said would come. Isn't it interesting how he constantly says what we have, is what they were promised? That the Christ would suffer that he would be the first to rise. Now, now, wait a minute. See, the Bible-believing Jews under the law covenant were looking for the resurrection. Instead of the general resurrection and the Messiah coming, there was one resurrection, and that was the Messiah. <laughs> and he was the prototype of everyone who would rise in the, after the, in the day of salvation came to an end, which is such a magnificent thing. It blows your mind. He said, well, I'm I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to raise the first new man from the dead, and that's Jesus. And we, we, that's what you're going to do too. He's the first to rise from the dead and would proclaim light to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. See, it's an inclusive experience here. Then my Romans 8.29, which is so lovely, where he uses a new term. Romans 8.29. Romans is such a marvelous chapter, isn't it? Yes, it is. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren and sisters too. Romans 8.29. Folks, he was the firstborn among many brethren. He was the first one among brethren. Isn't that something? You see, for God's love in its overflowing hugeness to further express itself, he had to make someone in his image. So he said, I'll make them in the image of my son. I'll put them on earth in a physical world with every intention of filling them with the Holy Spirit one day and giving them a spiritual body so they can fellowship with us on a new earth and new heavens. And to that end, the cross, the burial, the resurrection, the coming Holy Spirit. That's the plan of salvation. And he would be the firstborn among many brethren. Folks, he is the Holy God. He is the Lord God Almighty. But he is your brother. And he is the prototype of this new humanity, the first one of a kind. He was the first one off the assembly line. And this gospel we preach is not just simply you need to be forgiven, but you certainly do. But you need to be made new, buddy. Yeah. That's the whole problem up in here. And to be made new, you need the Holy Ghost. And to get the Holy Ghost, you're going to have to be forgiven and born of the Holy Ghost and then fill the Holy Ghost. And then, my friend, as he is, so are you in the world. And that's just the beginning of it all. Yeah. You are destined to be on a new earth, in new heavens, with your brother. What a magnificent thing. What a magnificent thing. I do want to quote from some of my authors.
I won't quote from them all, I'll just show you they're there. <laughs> First of all, from N.T. Wright, we know him well, don't we? Easter isn't just about you and me and our present spiritual experience or our hope beyond the grave. Easter is the beginning of God's new world. What a magnificent thing. Easter Day, listen to this, Easter Day, the history of the cosmos changed. What a thing. God so loved the world. That's cosmos. Everything. It all changed. All of a sudden, the whole cosmos got hope. That's what it was. It. They are groaning and travailing. By the way, if they're groaning and travailing and we're not supposed to be groaning and travailing, what are you groaning and travailing for? We're not supposed to be groaning and travailing. They're jealous of us because they're still groaning and travailing. If they're still groaning and travailing, we're living on this planet, buddy, and we do walk by faith, but the groaning and the travailing is going to stop. We're going to show off a shine like the sparkling sun in South Florida. And better. Marcus Barth said, God asserts himself. And he confirms his grace not only by revoking creation, not by revoking creation, but by creating a new man. And that new man was completed on the cross. We are new creation. Oscar Kuhlman said this, Christ the firstborn from the dead, his body the first resurrection body, the first spiritual body. Now there's significance in that because Corinthians says we will one day have a spiritual body prepared for us. He doesn't mean to say we'll be Casper's buddies. What he means is this. <laughs> Jesus had the first spiritual body. He had a body. He ate fish. There's hope for us here. We can eat in heaven. <laughs> it's true, isn't it? He yeah. ate fish. More like Arthur Treacher's, I don't know, with tartar sauce. But, but the truth be told, the truth be told, ladies and gentlemen, he had a body in the resurrection that was totally full of the Spirit. And that's exactly what we're going to have. So he says, Christ the firstborn from the dead, his body the first resurrection body, the first spiritual body. He had the first spiritual body and you will have a spiritual a body yourself. And, and there is already a new creation even though we are stuck here in this old creation. Gordon D. Fee said, Christ's death and resurrection mark the turning of the ages. You've got to let that in. It marks the turning of the ages. It warned the old evil age, this present evil age, buddy, change is here. Yeah. We're going to get you out of the way one of these days between now and then. I'm putting a little camp over there in your territory called churches full of new creation people who don't belong there and this world isn't worthy of them and now you just watch what it's going to do for you if you listen to them. He also says the old order has gone. The new creation has taken its place. I love this statement of his. I think I quoted it in my book. We live as expatriates on earth. Our true citizenship is in heaven. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I'm a, I'm, I'm a very patriotic American. God bless America, as our buddy says, that boxing guy says with his hair going bad. You know that guy? God bless America. And I mean that. Best shot we ever had at being free for Christians. But my citizenship is in heaven, and by that I mean there's a city up there called the real true Jerusalem that's coming down to earth one day, and that's where I belong. And oftentimes I just sit down there and, and lather myself with fluffy soap of remembrance and say, I don't belong here, I belong in heaven. No wonder I'm having such a hard time. I had a professor in one of our colleges, uh, old Dr. Noel Smith used to say, I I'm unadjusted, he says. <laughs> I'm unadjusted because I can't fit into this earth yet. And buddy, you'd better ever remain unadjusted. Yeah, yeah. The problem is too many Christians fit right in so beautifully. It's like standing on wet soap. It's supposed to always rub, rub you the wrong way. You know, now, could I throw out a commercial here for the love that's inside you, shared abroad by the Holy Spirit? Sure, you never fit, but don't be a pain in their neck or anybody else's. Be the best thing they ever met. Ah, I love that testament. He also said in another book, that is Gordon Fee, this people, that's the new creation people, are the true succession of the old. 
covenant people. Formed by the Spirit, they are an eschatological people who live the life of the future in the present as they await the consummation. You're living that life now, awaiting for the consummation. I love that stuff. Listen to what he says about Christians. It is the resurrection of Jesus to a new order of life. This is Donald Hagner now. That is the irrefutable demonstration of the end of death. The fact that you and I get saved and the sting of death is thus removed is irrefutable evidence that death is running out. Yeah. You're done. Death isn't where I'm standing. That's why you have the right in the Jesus who is the healer and the deliverer and the center freer to say, you don't belong here, buddy. This is a place where life lives. You go join death over there. And it's about time you put your bold socks on like mine. Look at those babies. Yeah. Get excited. Amen. Amen. Get excited. Amen. Say, how dare you? Life dwells in me. Right. Don't ask how your head feels. It's the part of the two thirds that still needs to be saved. Right. Yeah. Between now and then, you've got grace for it, power for it, and the love of God for it, and the Holy Ghost for it, the Word of God for it, and we're for you too. So, what else do you want? Right? Ah, oh, we can go home. No. <laughs> Stig Hansen says, We have a foretaste of the new life. Murray. Harris says, the inauguration of the new age has begun. And again, when the resurrection occurred, the new age dawned. The spirit was given and new spiritual power was released into the world. Folks, you've got to recognize that new spiritual power has been released in you. I don't feel powerful. It is irrelevant. Ask the canon if it feels strong. That's deep. That is deep. It's just a big old metal thing. A shove a ball in one end and put gunpowder in the other. That thing will take you down. You have it. Walk in it. Use it. Thank God for it. Celebrate it. The trouble is you're waiting for power to knock you down. No, no, you're supposed to knock it down. Harris said, when the resurrection occurred, the new age dawned. The spirit was given. A new spiritual power was released into the world. So I say, I believe it. I want, to, I want to talk to you about old Hagee. Not the gentleman in, in San Antonio, but the fellow from St. Louis. He, he did a lot of healing, a lot of miracle works uh, through his hands. God really anointed him. And he said, his, his son said after he was dead, you know when I used to go with my daddy as a young boy and he'd lay hands on folks and no one ever get healed in his services. <laughs> He just prayed that nothing would happen. And he prayed, he said he did this for years. And one day he said, Daddy, when are you going to stop this? Nothing ever happens. He said, Son, I believe God is the healer. And then when I lay hands on folks, the power is transferred to them. And I'm going to keep declaring that over people till it, it comes to pass in my ministry. Before the fat lady sang, nothing intended by that. I got news for you. He performed miracles, signs, and wonders. Wigglesworth was, was of the same order. You know, my, my mother's, my, wife, no, my, my wife's mother's uh, a, a cousin, I believe it was, was a missionary in the Congo. And I've got his book he wrote and his paintings he did in my bedroom. And he was a missionary with Smiggles, uh, Smith Wigglesworth's uh, son. And that man, uh, when he was about my age, lost all of his teeth. And you know you don't get new teeth unless you go to the dentist. And he prayed, and as soon as he, he writes about it in his book, it became well known and famous for it. He prayed, my God, I need teeth. This is terrible. I look awful. He prayed for his hand in his mouth, and he prayed in the name of Jesus. And folks, they, they have evidence, proof. He grew a tiny new set of teeth in his mouth like he was a child all over again. The trouble is, <laughs> folks don't believe God. Yeah. Faith comes by hearing. Faith comes by hearing. Faith comes by hearing. And then faith works by love, the Bible says. Yeah. So hear, and then put your love on it. Now let me explain that. Too many folks look at the ministry of the power, power ministry of the Holy Spirit, something they do. It's not. It's an act of love. So you know, God, you really love this guy, and he's in real trouble. And on behalf of your love, I'm praying for him right now, passing that love on in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. Amen. That's what it's all about. And so he also says the messianic age had dawned through the resurrection. 
Jesus had thus become the founder of the new humanity, the head of the people of the new age. There's another one I want. I'm jumping over people. There are men right now very frustrated that I didn't quote from them. <laughs> Pages of these lovely people. Ah, but we'll do Leslie Newbegin. That's an appropriate name for the book, too. Old Newbegin wrote about new beginnings. <laughs> Listen to this. He wrote a book about the local church and the power that should be in the church. And he said this. If the gospel is to challenge the public life of our society, and I've said this for decades, if Christians are to occupy the high ground which they vacated in the noontime of modernity, it will not be by forming a Christian political party or by aggressive propaganda campaigns. Once again, it has to be said that there can be no going back to the Constantinian era. May I remind you of what the Constantinian era was? The Constantinian era was when the Pope found out he could get out of his troubles by aligning himself with Constantine and they too married the state with the church. And all of a sudden the church got respectability and power. I'll crown you, you say I'm the good guy, we'll fight for one another. And that's all over Europe, that's all over Great Britain, and that's why we fled to America. Now, he said, when there's no going back to that Constantinian era. There isn't enough time left in history. Here we go. It will only be by movements that begin within the local congregation in which the reality of the new creation is present, known, and experienced. And from men and women who go into every sector of public life to claim it for Christ. That's the only way. That's the only way. What we need around the world today are great churches with people who know who they are, new creation believers in Christ. And wherever they go, they're not a pain in the neck. They're not pointing to themselves as better than you, but there are people who bring the love of God, the grace of the Lord Jesus, and the communion of the Holy Spirit into everything they do in such a way as to be as attractive as it really is. He also said this, uh, Leslie Newbegin, we have a new reality. Yes. Can I ask you that question right now? Do you have a new reality? Yes. Do you have a new reality? Or did you get saved and you stuck with the old reality? Mm. And the old rules and the old ways and the old plans? Do you have a new reality? What we need is a new reality. By the way, P.T. O'Brien said this, Christians live in the overlap of the two ages, this present age and the age to come. As those who are in Christ, we have already participated in the world to come. Isn't that something? Yeah. Uh, by the way, I like what uh, our buddy Rudabos, Herman Rudabos, said this. Thus the ecclesia, now you know what the ecclesia is, that's the church. Thus the ecclesia is the community of those who, as the true people of God, receive the gifts of the kingdom of heaven, provisionally now, already since the Messiah has come, and one day in a state of perfection when we have the whole thing given to us. Thus, Schweizer says, not Schweizer, <laughs> in Jesus, therefore, a whole new world has come into being. Listen to this. I think it's maybe the most important thing I'm going to say this morning. I know it's a little bit heavy, but you've got to get heavy to get light. In Jesus, therefore, a whole new world has come into being. Different laws are now in effect. Yeah. You've got to believe that. A whole new world has come into being. And different laws are now in effect. Spiritual laws are now dominating the physical. When Jesus was treated at his Father's right hand, he was given all authority by legal right, purchased on the cross. And he said, you have all authority now in heaven and earth. You're over the whole thing. He turned to us and said, I give you that power and authority. Use your authority. Take dominion in your world and show them what Christ looks like. In Jesus, therefore, a whole new world has come into being. Different laws are now in effect. I'm now going to go to the very end, which is the beginning. Isn't this marvelous? Would you like to have a look at this afterwards? No, you can't. All right, now we're at this page. This is why in the dispensation of grace, the key word is new. And I'm going to give you some news quickly. 
First of all, we have a New Testament that goes with this new creation. In Hebrews 10, 20, we have a new and living way consecrated for us through his flesh. In 1 Corinthians eleven twenty five, this is the new cup, the new covenant in my blood, the New Testament. We have a new covenant, a covenant of grace. And Hebrews 8, 13 says he's made the first obsolete. In Romans 9, 14, he says he is the mediator of a new covenant. Number three, we have a new church. He said, I'm going to build my church now. There was the Quahal of the Old Testament when they gathered together, translated in your LXX as Ecclesia. Now I'm going to do mine. And when you, when you visit a real church, you're supposed to be visiting something owned by Jesus. Yes. Right. It's not, I'm going to do this. Let's, honey, it's no coincidence that Jesus is called the Great Shepherd. And at best, I'm an under-shepherd. I'm class B. <laughs> With a warning. Don't lord. You're going to answer to me. The fact of the matter is, it's my church. That is his. Well, that's why Ephesians 3.21 says, To him, that is Jesus, be glory in the church by Christ Jesus, or throughout or to all generations forever and ever. That's where he will get glory now. Your testimony is great all by yourself. But I've got news for you. It's the corporate power of our testimony. A body of believers that look like Jesus over there on the corner of 4th and 15th. That's where the power is. He's made a new lump out of the old. First Corinthians 5, 7 says that you may be a new lump. That is to say, not the old, but the new. A new birth. John 3, 3, 6 and 7. That which is born of the Spirit. Born again. A new birth. A new heart that was promised us and fulfilled in uh, Hebrews 8, 9, and 10 from Ezekiel 36, 26, and 27. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. And then the promise from Ezekiel eleven nineteen, and my spirit will be within them. In Romans 8, 9, if you don't have the spirit, you don't belong to God. There's a new spirit now. They didn't have any of this. There's a new name in heaven. Revelation 2, 17, a new name was written, it says. You have a new song in your heart, Revelation 5, 9. They sang a new song, it says. Yeah. We have a new commandment, it's love. 2 John 5, 1 John 3, 14 and 15, Romans 5, 5. You say you're rushing. Yes, I am. He said, I'm giving you a new commandment, it's actually the old commandment. What do you mean when he said, I'm giving you a new commandment, that's actually the old commandment? What he was saying was, it's the old commandment in as much as I always wanted you to love one another, but it's new in as much as now you do it by grace with the Spirit of God in your heart, not by law. Romans 12, 1 and 2 tells us we have a new mind. Wow. And therefore a new belief system. 2 Peter three thirteen says we have new heavens and a new earth. And therefore a New Testament hope. Revelation 3.12 says we have a new Jerusalem. Folks, the whole idea of it all is newness. And that newness is based on the newness of the prototokos, the prototype, Jesus Christ, who was the first to be raised with a, a, a spirit-infused body. And I believe today God wants you to settle that, and he wants you to sit there and say in your heart of hearts, I owe to this newness to live a new life. To stop thinking old thoughts that actually damage my newness. They take the shine off it. Yeah. New acts rather than old acts. I do have a body. I do have a soul. And I am living in the grace. And I'm standing in it. Thank you, Lord Jesus. But I have now to come across with some new acts. I have a newness about me that Jesus wants me to walk out, walk in, live in. It's a choice. Newness isn't something God does for you. It's something God has given to you that he wants you to walk in now by faith. Amen. It's so important. I, I, I see too many beloved brethren and sisters. <laughs> and they believe in the new creation. But they live in an old world under the old ways, under the old conditions, with the old fears, with the old anxieties, with the old bad habits, with all the criticisms and ugliness of old. When you bump into a real church and you walk into a real door, you'd better smell new everywhere. It'd better be like that smell you walk into one of those mobile homes that's never been opened for and just built. You feel like you're going to die from all the, what is that I'm smelling, peroxide? Formaldehyde. Yay! 
You, you better not smell like formaldehyde, but you better smell like new. Yeah. Smell like new, ladies and gentlemen, because you are new. And it doesn't matter if you feel new, it is irrelevant. My soul rarely feels new. It's not supposed to, that's a little strange. When it does, celebrate it. <laughs> Enjoy it. Get all you can out of it, because this afternoon more than likely won't. We are new. And Easter Sunday birthed this new. We've got to celebrate ourselves. Because of our brother, the Lord Jesus. We just celebrate our newness. And say, I'm new. I'm having less old thoughts than ever before. What's it cast that down? Every one of those thoughts that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, Christ. Now that's interesting. He says, don't let anything in your head get to, out of hand. <coughs> Get back to oldness. I'm not trying to put you on a guilt trip. I'm trying to get you to see how beautiful you look, how new you are, and what an incredible thing is in you and around you, and what a new opportunity to live you have so that you can enjoy this thing. Because Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and that more abundantly. Amen. That wasn't a feeling. That wasn't a perfect marriage and a perfect job and a perfect home and a perfect weather and all the rest. That's ridiculous. We above all people, our greatest testimony, isn't it, Mr. We don't smoke dacha and get drunk and fall in the street and get picked up and scooped up and taken home. Uh, don't do that anymore. Wonderful. A lot of lost people don't do that either. Your testimony is your newness in the midst of the old, even when the old seems to knock you flat. It is true. It is true. Your miracle isn't, God, help me with the red. No, the red didn't show up. But my newness did. Amen. See, that's the problem we have here. We keep, we keep wanting perfect to feel perfect. No, you got perfect, right. buddy. It's already there. What you need to do is acknowledge it. Yes, amen, amen. It's true. Amen. It is true. It's new. I think new. I see new. I am new. Thank God for new. Thank God. And I have to change and reorientate my entire life to match up with the glory of what I am. Because I'm a deposit from the future, living in the past. The eternal age has broken into this present evil age and plonked me down here with the Spirit of God inside me. And my brother Jesus in heaven, the first of an entire type of humanity that will only show up in the resurrection, not when you die. When you die, you won't look like Jesus. That happens in the resurrection. We are all going to do that together, Paul said. Don't worry. No one's going to get ahead of you. Whether you're dead, <laughs> whether you're dead or you're alive, it's going to happen to all of us at the same time. <laughs> I'm not even going to touch this business of dying and dreaming and dying and going to heaven and stuff. I don't go anywhere near it. Just, you know, it's lovely. I'm happy for you. Can we read the Bible right now? <laughs> because the fact of the matter is, it's going to happen. But I want to challenge you with Easter, the Easter message, and say, God wants you to walk in today what will fill the world tomorrow. That's right. By faith, I will Amen. not accept this. The word is you're accepting too much that doesn't belong to you. Too much negativity, too much evil, too much fear, too much problem. No, that, you have a better heritage than that. You're a greater person than that. You have more going for you than that. You've got God on your side. You are new now. We're new. Let's reach the world with new. Let's banish the old from our lives. It doesn't belong. Let's act like we belong in a new heaven and a new earth. Because you do. You're beautiful. And I'm proud of you. And I believe in you. And God believes in you. Now believe in yourself in Christ to the glory of God. Amen. Let's eat. No, let's pray. Lord, we're so excited. Thank you for Easter. Thank you for the new, 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 Lord Jesus. And today we devote ourselves to newness. To live as expatriates on earth from heaven. Tomorrow, today, the way our brother Jesus would want us to. We honor you, Lord Jesus. We're in awe of you. Help us to be as you are on this earth today to spread the news.
Praise God, folks.